For the past four years, I've been studying leadership in professional service firms, and I received a major grant from the UK government in order to do that. In the previous interview, in the previous report, I talked about leadership dynamics, and I talked about the phenomenon of the leadership constellation that I'd identified through my research. I was interested in how a group of individuals, a collective leadership group within these firms, comes together interacts with each other, to influence each other and to bring about change within their organisation as a whole. The second report looks at all the case studies in the research and draws together common themes to understand better how individuals end up in these leadership positions and what they actually do once they get there. And together with my colleague Johan Alverhus, I've identified three leadership tactics in professional service firms. And you need to be able to operate effectively on all three of these dimensions simultaneously in order to pull off the very difficult job of leading a professional service firm. What makes leadership so interesting in the context of these firms is that ultimately individual partners see each other as peers and expect very high degrees of individual autonomy but they may choose to cede authority to an individual to have some kind of leadership position over them. So the question I was asking myself is, well, what is it about a person that makes them seem appropriate to the rest of the partners? And ultimately, it comes down to their success in the marketplace, their ability to bring in business, to bring in high-profile, high-prestige business. Ultimately, that has nothing to do with leadership. It is all about their ability and their skills as a practitioner. An interesting question is, what has winning deals with clients got to do with leading a professional firm? And I think there are three factors behind it. And the first one is about measuring the ambiguous. Ultimately, it is extremely hard, even for a fellow professional, to judge your ability as a professional because of the ambiguous nature of the work and the ambiguous nature of the knowledge. So one of the few tangible measures of quality and success that we have in these kinds of firms is the ability to bring in work and generate high levels of chargeable hours. So I think it's partly about measuring the ambiguous, but it's also about if you generate business in this kind of firms, it's not just you that benefits, it's everyone else, it's the partners as a whole. So that in order to lead the partnership, you have to first prove to them that you're capable of feeding the partnership. And the third element is about role modelling. As a leader, if you're going to be asking, requiring your fellow partners to give their all for the firm, you have to first of all prove that you've done that yourself, that you have made the ultimate sacrifices for the sake of the firm. And it's that ability to role model professional behaviour which causes you to gain and retain this legitimacy amongst your peers. So once you've been elected or selected by your peers and allowed to assume one of these leadership positions, the next big challenge you've got is how to enable autonomy whilst maintaining control. Whilst continuing to demonstrate success in the marketplace, you, st you can't give up what you were doing before, but you have to do a heck of a lot more. So your peers will want and indeed need a considerable amount of autonomy in order to exercise their professional judgment to decide how best to service their clients in particular contexts. And you need to allow that, you need to facilitate that, you need to free them up to do that. But at the same time, it shouldn't be an anarchy. So all the time in these leadership positions, you're managing this continuous balancing act of being simultaneously tight and loose. The third tactic is covert. It's about acting politically, whilst appearing apolitical. 
And in a sense, that was one of the most surprising things that emerged from my research. What struck me at a quite early stage in the interview process was how many individuals were very keen to tell me that they weren't political, that their organisations weren't political, and indeed, if people were seen to be behaving politically in their organisations, they suffered as a result. And this surprised me for two reasons. Firstly, because I never asked any questions about politics, so I didn't understand why people were so keen to talk to me about something which they thought didn't exist in their firms. And secondly, because what I was observing in these organisations was an enormous amount of political behaviour and some enormously skilled political individuals. And I realised that these organisations are absolutely rife with politics, yet it seems to be part of a professional services firm's identity, the need to deny this, to ignore it, to pretend it's not there. Which is all the more peculiar because the partners of these firms have created intensely political environments that very closely resemble political parties. Yet unlike politicians, they seem to feel the need to deny constantly that they're behaving politically. And I think it comes down to the fact that they have actually a really rather naive and unsophisticated understanding of political behaviour. And they seem to confuse it with sort of crude concepts of Machiavellianism. But actually, political behaviour, politically skilled individuals, have some very important and valuable qualities which you could argue any leader really needs to deploy. So the most important political skills that an individual needs in this context are social astuteness, networking ability in order to build alliances, interpersonal influence in order to convince people of your underlying objectives, and perhaps most importantly, apparent sincerity. So what does apparent sincerity look like? I was really interested by the way people in my study talked about a number of senior leaders within their firm. And they used language like genuine and clean, honest, modest, self-effacing, humble, decent, as opposed to words like creeping and slightly sinister. And what I realised, of course, was that what was most important in this context was that they were seen to be ambitious for the firm more than they were ambitious for themselves, and to communicate that to the rest of the partnership and to inspire the partners with that belief. And in the sense, it didn't really matter whether they were personally ambitious or not in that context, as long as they could persuade the rest of the partnership that they had a vision and an ambition for the firm that the rest of them could all share in. What's emerged very clearly from this phase of the research is the phenomenon of the reluctant leader. And you can find the explanations for this phenomenon in all three of the tactics that I've identified. The first one, gaining and retaining the legitimacy to lead through market success. People who rise to the top of these organisations are expected to move away from the thing they love to do most, which is to work with clients. To do something else which they haven't really done very much of before. So you can start to understand why they may be reluctant to do that, and indeed why the majority of professionals, senior professionals, are reluctant to take on these substantial leadership roles. The second reason for reluctance lies with the second leadership tactic, enabling autonomy whilst maintaining control. Ultimately, this balancing act of being simultaneously too tight and too loose is phenomenally difficult. Individuals moving into senior le leadership roles in these firms have the responsibility to deliver success for the firm. They are accountable to the partnership for, for achieving that. And yet they have very little authority in order to carry it out. The third reason for being reluctant is bound up with a third leadership tactic, acting politically whilst appearing apolitical. If you seem to be too eager for power, too eager to be in control, that's a surefire way of ensuring that your peers will not elect you into a position of authority over them. 
So what kind of individual has got what it takes in order to operate effectively in these three dimensions, to be effective at all three leadership tactics simultaneously? Through this research study, my previous research studies, and indeed through my consulting work over many years, I've identified ten qualities of an effective leader of a professional service firm. The first one is to be highly respected for their skills as a professional. The second is that they don't appear to be seeking power. The third is that they're able to inspire loyalty and commitment. And fourthly, to have a strong personal vision and to be able to communicate it. It's very important that they are able to build consensus, yet also to act decisively, to know when to stop building consensus and when to take action. To be able to transfer responsibility, but also to intervene selectively. And that, in a sense, is about the too tight, too loose dynamic I was talking about. It's very important that they are comfortable with ambiguity and conflict. They need to be willing to spend a lot of time massaging egos and not to expect to have their own ego massaged. But above all, and this is returning to the theme of the first report, to be able to identify and navigate the power dynamics within their firms to truly understand the leadership constellation. So for the next phase of the research, I'm going to be thinking in more detail about how my findings can help individual leaders to operate more effectively, but also to help the firms themselves develop identify and select the most effective leaders in this context. The second element I want to look at in more detail is about digging into this idea of enabling autonomy whilst maintaining control, but specifically exploring the nature of the leadership dyad, typically the two individuals at the top of these organisations. And the third thing that I want to explore within my research going forward is this theme of politics within professional firms. I find it absolutely fascinating that something that is so present and so powerful within these organisations is so fervently denied by the people within them.